You know, we're in the midst of a study called Power. And um, it's a study of the miracles of Jesus as he begins to demonstrate more and more of his authority. We saw that in his Sermon on the Mount, that when Jesus spoke, people listened to him and said, he speaks with an authority unlike those of our teachers. Underscoring again that when Jesus spoke, he was very often using that first person as if he was speaking for God himself. And indeed he was. You read in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus would say, you've heard what was said, but I say unto you. Putting his words and the, the, the words of God on the same plane. And people were amazed that he would teach them that way. Then it, it came to a point where Jesus now is going to demonstrate in a very unique way his authority. And so Matthew, the writer of this gospel, is beginning to unfold for us the identity of who Jesus is. And in that identity, what he begins to do is to just give us a glimpse of some up-close and personal works of God. So, for instance, we've seen, in, uh, as we looked at these passages, that when you open up to chapter 8, it begins by... Um, by a, a, a little interaction with Jesus with some, what proves out to be some pretty reluctant kind of disciples. Jesus had already healed a leper. He had healed a centurion's son. He healed Peter's mother-in-law from a fever. All of which was underscoring again that Jesus had power that demonstrated that he was willing, he was able, he was good. And, and, and he was using his power redemptively to bring back life and health into all those who would come around him. Following those miracles, it says that two disciples would come up to him, or would-be disciples came up to him and said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus' response was, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. Another man comes and says that, it implies that his father was ill, that he needed to, you know, uh, arrange for his burial. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. For you, come, follow me. What follows is, you don't see those two guys getting in the boat. Uh, Jesus was going to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, but those two gentlemen were not in the boat, which, in, you know, underscores the fact that they really did not follow Jesus in a way in which now he was going to be tutoring them the same way he was now with uh, Peter and, and, uh, and his brother Andrew or James and John. So what happens next is they get into the boat. You remember the stories, right? The, the storm that comes out on the sea. And the waves churn and the wind blows and seasoned fishermen like Peter and John, they respond by you know, really panicking, thinking that they're going to die. It, it doesn't look good. Jesus is uh, alerted. He calms the waves and the sea. And the text says that uh, for the disciples, they stood in awe. They were amazed at what had just taken place. And it says that they thought to themselves, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? What kind of man is this? Matthew is giving you a hint at what kind of man this is. This is, this is one to whom even creation, you know, um, is under his authority. Jesus uses language there about rebuking the waves and the sea, language reminiscent of what God did in the days when he parted the Red Sea and the Egyptians would walk through. The, the psalmist, many of whom would recount that deliverance of God uh, 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 from, the, from the, um, the oppression of the Egyptians, and what God would do there was to use that same language about how God rebuked the seas so that Israel could walk through on dry land. All of which is just underscoring again that there is something unique about this Jesus. This power that he is displaying is reminiscent of the, of the power that God the Father used in setting free Israel from Egypt. Now, Jesus is demonstrating that same authority over all of creation. The very next story 
is Jesus uh, healing two um, demon-possessed individuals. They come, and Jesus, without say, was just with one word, it says, um, causes these evil spirits to, to come out of these two men, restoring them to health. You know the rest of the story, the evil spirits go into these herd of pigs, and it results in a loss of income, right, for those who were in this town. People come, they're freaked out by what Jesus did. It's a pretty crazy story. But again, if you understand by reading through the scriptures that this presence of evil is always there to kind of, you know, uh, to steal and to corrupt and to, and to just destroy whatever it touches, in this context, all that did was promote uh, or, or take Jesus in a light that showed him to be, you know, um, this, this one who was stirring things up, and the town wanted no part of it. They wanted Jesus to leave. In fact, it says that they pleaded with Jesus to leave. But again, Matthew is answering this question, right? Who is this man? Like, what kind of man is he? Well, he's Lord over creation, but now he, sees, he shows himself to be Lord over the powers of darkness. And then we get the story of Jesus healing a paralytic. We looked at that last week, right? And, and healing the paralytic, Jesus first says, your sins have been forgiven. That then the real story comes to the forefront. And what's that real story? The real story is that the teachers of the law heard Jesus say that your sins are forgiven, and immediately they said that's blasphemous. The only one who could forgive sin is God himself, right? So Jesus was claiming that he had the authority to forgive sin. And that didn't sit well with the teachers of the law. And so Jesus engages them and says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? And they say, so that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Take up your mat and go home. And this paralyzed man gets up and walks. Again, demonstrating that Jesus has authority not only over created things, not only over the powers of darkness, but Jesus has the power to forgive sin. So what happens next should be of interest to you because this string of three miracles happened with two reluctant disciples turning their backs on Jesus. I want you to notice what comes next, though, in your text here in Matthew chapter 9. Let me read it to you. It begins here in verse 9. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And then John's disciples, he's speaking here about John the Baptist, right? The one who had baptized Jesus earlier. John's disciples come to Jesus and they ask him, how is it that we and the Pharisees, we fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins, it says, will burst. And not only that, he says that if they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, 
and both are preserved. Now, we've been talking about miracles. We've been talking about power. We've been talking about how Jesus has demonstrated that he is willing and able and good. And then we've seen this other three, uh, set of three miracles where Jesus is now seen to have authority over creation, over the powers of darkness, and now over sin. Do you notice how the next, the next you know, uh, introduction now is of another disciple? Holy, this time they respond favorably to Jesus. So Matthew's given you, and by the way, the Matthew that's talking about here following Jesus is the one who wrote this gospel. So Matthew's telling us that as a result of all of these things that Jesus was demonstrating, it was enough not only to get Matthew's attention, but when Jesus goes out of his way to speak to Matthew, Matthew responds. You see, there's a difference between the first set of disciples that were very reluctant, and now you have Matthew. But notice what happens with Matthew. Matthew, it says, invites Jesus to his home, right? He says, Matthew got up, followed him. When Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's home, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So Jesus is kind of socializing with those who people would have kept at arm's distance. There, there would not have been this kind of association. There, there was no visiting. This, this, they would have been considered, you know, um, not proper company to keep. And if you were a Pharisee, right, if you were a, a religious leader, you certainly would not have um, taken the liberty to, to, to wine and dine with, uh, with tax collectors and sinners. They were on the bottom, on the bottom rung. Many have thought they were irredeemable. So what is Jesus doing here? What I have been contending all along is that this display of authority, not only in Jesus' teaching, but also in the power that he is displaying, is so that you and I would make decisions to follow after him. The, the, the whole tenor of Matthew's storyline is to get you and me to have enough confidence in who this person is, the Son of God, named Jesus, who has come to save his people from their sins. He is the promised Messiah. That, Matthew has been making a case for that since the opening of our gospel that we ought to take a very good look at this Jesus that was born of the Virgin Mary because he's fulfilling all of what the prophets have said about him. Not only in his birth narrative story, but also in his teaching and now in his miracles. So when you read this text and you see after doing these, um, de demonstrating a, a, a different kind of authority, the disciples now they're, they're beginning to bind a little bit closer to Jesus, but now when the call goes out to Matthew, Matthew responds. Because that's what should happen when we're learning more and more about who this Jesus is, is so that you and I would feel more and more comfortable in our understanding of who he is and what his mission is all about, so that we would follow after him. But there's a couple of things about this. What is really, when you look at this text, what is the end game for Jesus then? If the end game is so that you and I, we would understand that we are salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, we have been called now to, to follow after Jesus, to, to hear his words and to put them into practice. Isn't that what he told us in the Sermon on the Mount? If, if that's the end game for Jesus, he's helping to ease everyone's hesitancy by demonstrating in power that he is the one who has been promised. So Jesus' end game is to formulate a people that would not only know him, but represent him in the world around us. That, that's a, a significant point here when you begin to really read through your Bibles. 
Because Jesus is saying to you and me, we're part of his plan A. And there is no plan B. Plan A is that you and I go out into a broken world and we represent him who is this redeemer who promises not only to forgive men of sin, but to take you from this life into the one to come. And all those promises now are going to come because Jesus is demonstrating an authority that he can fulfill all those promises. But who's he choosing? This is God now manifest in the flesh. He can't do any better than tax collectors and sinners. Like, why not go after the leaders and the shakers? Why, why not concentrate on the, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day? Why, why do you have to muck it up with all of the, the lowest class of people around him? And you think about this for a moment. Matthew was a Jew. But who did Matthew work for? Matthew worked for the Roman government. See, the Romans figured out that if they were going to, you know, uh, really bring a people into submission, it would be better if they could kind of erect puppet leaders within the Jewish community. So you have Herod, a Jew, right, who was placed by Caesar. You have Matthew, who's given a right of taxation to, what, tax his fellow Jews, and he would extort them so that he would earn a pretty good living, and then he would also then give tax money back to the Romans. So how much love do you think there existed between his fellow Jews and Matthew? Probably very little, right? Peter is a working man. He's a fisherman. He spends most of his time out on that Sea of Galilee trying to eke a living. Some days were harder than others. And it wasn't just the long nights of fishing. You'd come in, then you'd have to get your, whatever catch you had to market. Then you had to you know, fix your nets. I mean, it was a grueling, manual, you know, um, by the strength of your back kind of a job. How do you think Peter felt about Matthew? Where he would now be taxed on whatever he caught. And it would oftentimes be indiscriminate. It would be whatever Matthew thought he could extort from, from those he was having taxed. It wasn't like a regulated system. The system was what Matthew had contrived. What, what the market would bear. So if you're, Matthew, if you're Peter and you're out there working all day long and now you come home and some, some guy, a fellow Jew working for the Roman government comes up to you and says, hey, I'm going to tax you on the fish that you caught. I'm going to tax you on the, on, on the boat. I'm going to tax you on, on the carts that you use to bring it to market. Yeah, how much do you like this guy? In a little while, we're going to be introduced in chapter 10 to the other disciples that Jesus is calling. One of those other disciples is, a, is, a, is a, a, one of the, the 12 apostles is an a individual named Simon the Zealot. A zealot was a political party. They were, for all you know, uh, purposes here, they were, they were terrorists. They, they, they so believed in the, in the state of Israel that they were trying to remove any of the, of the oppression that the Romans were bringing upon, upon the nation of Israel. They wanted to be free from Rome. In fact, this seditious group is doing everything they can to undermine the work of the Romans. That would continue until the war of Masada would come and uh, Rome would come and just wipe out the whole city and tear down the temple. And it would all be, it would all be over. Many, many would be massacred in the war of Masada. 
That would be about, you know, 30 years after Jesus died. So this is the kind of party that they're, they're persistent. They, they're trying to, 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 like I said, liberate themselves from Roman oppression. <laughs> but that's one of the guys that Jesus chooses to be a part of his 12. These disciples that now are going to have a very up close and personal look at not only Jesus' wor- words, but his actions, the way in which he engaged people, the things that he was teaching them, all of this to inspire them because he called them to do what? To be fishers of men. Jesus already said that those who belong to the, to the kingdom of heaven, you're salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Don't lose your saltiness. Don't hide your light. So when the end game for Jesus is not just to display to the world who he is, but Jesus comes into the world to bring forgiveness of sin and also a hope of glory. And he's going to do that person by person, inviting anyone who would listen to come and embrace this new hope. So think about this now. If Simon the Zealot was all about emancipating Israel from Roman oppression, how much love do you think Simon the Zealot had for Rome? Nil, right? How much love do you think Simon the Zealot had for Matthew, who's a Jew working for the Roman government and exercising an undue authority over his fellow Jews? How much love do you think existed between Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector? It was worse than what existed between Peter and Matthew, for sure. Peter and Matthew definitely didn't get along. They, they probably, you know, really detested, you know, Matthew. But Simon the Zealot, he probably wanted to take Matthew out. Barabbas, the one that was given in exchange for Jesus on the cross, he was a zealot. He, had, he already had killed individuals. So Simon the Zealot, I'm sure that when Jesus called him, Matthew would sleep at night with one eye open, keeping his eye out on Simon. Not trusting him whatsoever. But I asked the questioner, I said, what's the end game? Think about this. Jesus calls a tax collector. Jesus calls this fisherman. Jesus calls Simon the Zealot to all be a part now of a group of individuals who are going, he's going to use, and they're going to change the world. How does that happen? You know how it happens? It's because Jesus gets a hold of their hearts. And he changes Peter. And he changes Matthew. He changes Simon the Zealot. And now these individuals that on the surface, there would be so much baggage that would get in the way from those individuals really having any meaningful relationship with one another. Jesus comes as the reconciler and brings all these disparate parties that are away from each other. He brings them all together. Think about that when you're starting to think about this idea of reconciliation, about how God is trying to bring people to put down those barriers of hostility, those those wedges that we kind of put in relationships. Jesus is all about reconciling people one to another and to himself. This is always a good thing. And people just couldn't get that. In fact, isn't that what the response then is of the Pharisees? They see what Jesus is doing and they're not buying it. They're they're all about what their rules are and how people need to be following in these customs and these traditions, even if they're violating the very scriptures themselves. So much so that the Pharisees turned to his disciples and says, 
why does your teacher eat with these tax collectors and sinners? Because it wasn't just that he called them. Jesus is having dinner at, at Matthew's house. People, no doubt, that were far away from the things of God at that moment, but now something is happening in, P, in Matthew's life, and maybe his friends, his circles, his peer, now they're taking a look at Matthew, and they're wondering, what's up with him? And they're curious about this Jesus, who no doubt, in his own hometown, is garnering for himself quite the reputation. Maybe some are just curious, and they want to find out what Jesus is all about. Maybe some of them are in that group, and they want some of what they begin to see Matthew is experiencing. And I, I'll just tell you straight up, I think that's what happens with you and me. People see the work of God in your life, and maybe it kind of inspires them to take another look at Jesus. We know that happens in reverse, right? When Christians act unseemly, when, when, when we do things that brings disrepute upon this profession that we make, don't you sometimes feel like Christians give one another black eyes in the public? The way they treat one another, the things that they say, how they act in, in, in such a, um, a, 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 in a way that's completely apart from the profession that they're making. You feel embarrassed about it. Well, if that happens on the negative, I can assure you it happens in the positive. Let someone demonstrate the qualities that Jesus is calling us to, a a humility and a service where where we we are loving one another from the heart, where we are not quick to judge, but we're quick to forgive, quick to listen. What do you think happens then? It's so far of what people are experiencing in the world around us that it just might get their attention. And I think that's exactly what's happening in Matthew's house. Jesus shows up, and he doesn't act like those who are, um, you know, uh, far from, from, um, from the Lord. No, Jesus is consistent with his character. He's letting his light shine. And it's interesting to me that these individuals be, would feel comfortable enough to be hanging out with Jesus. So I say this to you because what's the end game? The end game is that Jesus now in his words and in his actions is calling people from the world and saying, look, I want you to come and follow me. I want you to learn of me so that you can represent me in the world because a day is coming when everyone is going to be judged on what they did with Jesus. That's a sobering thought. So when the Pharisees want to know why he's doing that, Jesus responds saying, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. Is that what he says? He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they think they had it all together. If they just kept the rules, if they just acted in a certain way, then they were good. Jesus is saying they're far away. Because they don't feel that they need what Jesus is offering. But Matthew does. Peter does. Simon the Zealot will, and so many others, because they open themselves up to be instructed. They're not acting like they have all the answers. In fact, they're searching for those answers, and they're finding them in Jesus. John's disciples, they were all about getting people ready for the coming of this Messiah, John the Baptist would say, here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And, the Pharise- and, and so, the, so John's disciples, they're saying, how come, 
How come your disciples, Jesus, aren't fasting like the Pharisees and everybody do? And Jesus is saying to them, he says, using that age-old metaphor of a wedding banquet, very often the, the, the days of, of um, when the world is going to be redeemed, when, when all things are going to be made new, it, it talks about that in terms of this great wedding feast that's going to be held in the kingdom of heaven. All are going to be invited. Jesus is saying to them, right now the bridegroom is present. So why is everybody going to be fasting? Why, why is everybody going to be, they ought to be enjoying his presence now because the time is coming when he will leave. Jesus is again just hinting that he's going to, his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension is going to cause a period of time when Jesus is not going to be physically present with them. And so he tells them, now's not the time for that. And then he goes on, he says this, it's, it's kind of a little bizarre, but he says, no one sews a patch of unstruck cloth, cloth on an old garment because the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither does a man pour wine into an old wineskin. If they do, the skin's gonna burst, the wine will run out, you lose the wine, you lose the wineskin, everything is lost. The point here is that Jesus says, no, you put the old wine into old wineskins and you put the new wine into new wineskins. Jesus is saying you have to preserve the old, and make room to introduce something new. Jesus is coming now, and he's saying, I am introducing this kingdom of heaven, this gospel that I'm preaching, this good news is to get people ready to have their minds open, their hearts open, to receive what I have to give them, because it's going to affect not only their life now, but this life that is to come. And so at this point in Matthew's gospel, what he has done for you and me is saying, Jesus has given us enough evidence now of who he is and what he is going to do and what he's capable of doing so that when he calls us, we'll follow him. Matthew does. Some of those tax collectors and sinners, they do because they're open. This is what Jesus' end game is all about, that to as many as believe on him, he gives them the right to be called children of God. There is no big threshold that you have to climb over to get into the kingdom of heaven. It's all of grace. It's all of what Jesus is doing to accommodate people from from every strata, nobody's out unless they choose to walk away. So you do realize that this church that Jesus is building is being built by people who have responded to his word and to his teaching, and no one is going to be left out. For Jesus, the end game is to build this refuge, this spiritual house in this world because one day he's going to return. And when he does, he's going to redeem all things. Let me close with this simple illustration. There was a guy, his name is Paul Hebert, a pretty famous mathematician, and he, um, he gave voice to this concept of what he called, um, I, I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget. He, he talked about bounded sets and centered sets. This is all about math, but let me, let me tell you what, what this was all about because it has bearing and uh, I'll conclude with this. In a bounded set, we make a list of natural kinds of characteristics that we align with. So for instance, if I was to say, who is invited to a family reunion? 
What would your answer be? Family. What, what, what does it mean to be family? Well, most people are going to say, well, it's, you're born into this family, right? You have to have this same name, or you, were bo- or you were married into this family, or you were adopted into this family. But these are the, this is the characteristics of who we are. This is, this is who is invited to this party. That would be an example of a bounded set. If I was to say to you, how many people play a musical instrument? And you raise your hand, and then I said, okay, how many of you would consider yourself musicians? Probably some of you might put your hand down, because why? You're, you're, you're going to define a musician by what? That I, I reach a certain level of proficiency? Maybe I do it professionally? Like, what, what's that standard then that says... I can claim the name of, I can claim that title of musician. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're sitting at home and you're playing your guitar and you, and you get a lot of enjoyment out of that, you're a musician. You may not be as good as, let's say, Drew on that guitar, but that doesn't mean that you are going to enjoy it any less for yourself. So what keep what what that that idea of them being a musician is like it's music that carries this trail of people on various stages of development. They're all musicians. It's just some are better than others, and we're all on this path because we have this love for music. Let me let me draw the conclusion here. There were Pharisees, teachers of the law, and the like who made their little list of what it meant to be inside this box. You had to fast regularly, right? You had to give and tithe certain amounts. You you had to participate in in, uh, their ritual worship services. It was, you had to, you know, uh, ceremonially wash your hands before you ate. They had all these kinds of rules and regulations for what it meant to be in. And if you didn't obey those rules, people would look at you suspect and say, well, you're not in. You see what Jesus is doing though? He's saying that to be a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that I have to be a part of this bounded set. What I really have to do is demonstrate that I have set my mind and my heart on him. Which then leaves room for that tax collector who's just starting out and that seasoned follower of Jesus. We can be a little patient because this person, they they just haven't learned enough yet, but their heart's desire is to know a little bit more about Jesus, but maybe nobody's ever really given them enough instruction. Maybe it's just a a matter of time for them to become a little bit more mature in their walk with God. But you're not going to discount this person out because they don't fit in your description. People do that sometimes with their traditions. You grew up Lutheran, and there's things about being Lutheran that you really like, or Episcopalian, or, you know, Presbyterian, or Pentecostal. But if you start judging everybody by your little standard... Don't you see that you're violating the very principle of what Jesus is saying to you and me now in this text? Jesus came not for the healthy, he came for the sick. He's opening it up to everybody because his end game is to build this church of God that represents him well in the world until he comes back. What Jesus is all about is making sure that your heart and your mind are stayed on him. And so we ought to be showing grace to one another, demonstrating that grace to the people around us, because nobody has arrived. That's the church that Jesus is building. That's the one that he's inviting us into. And at this stage in the story of Matthew, he's doing that because he says, (laughs) I'm the Lord over creation. I'm the Lord over the powers of evil. 
I have authority to forgive sin. Come, follow me. Does that speak to you? Is that where your heart is? Is that the kind of grace that we're going to demonstrate to people all around us? Not that they have to fulfill all of our man-made rules, but they just have in their heart a desire to know Jesus. And it gets messy. No doubt it was kind of messy for Jesus when he was in that house, when he was in Matthew's house. But he went there because he loved them. And he recognized, I'm here not for the healthy. I'm here for the sick. I'm not here for the righteous. I'm here for the sinner. That's a great, that's a great place to be to represent him in a world that so desperately needs it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for these words. I want to thank you for the way in which you speak into our lives. I want to thank you for a picture of Jesus that is so open and accommodating, calling people, Lord, into a life, an abundant life, where they know you And they can experience for themselves something of this power. When your eyes are open to see in Jesus this kind of Savior, it feeds you every day. It empowers you, Lord, to never get up, never give up, but to run this race of faith with great endurance. I pray that would always be the case for us that as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we would run with endurance this race of faith. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.